After decades of growing tensions, increasing violence, and rising animosity, the American Civil War began on April 12, 1861, with a Confederate attack on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. The defenders, unable to repel the assault, were forced to surrender to the rebels, sparking what would become the deadliest conflict in U.S. history. The war, however, was not supposed to be a long conflict, as the Union assumed they would be able to crush the Confederacy quickly, thanks to their superior numbers and resources. While the Confederate soldiers believed their skilled soldiers would easily repel the Federalist Army from the southern states in a brief defensive campaign that would result in a swift compromise of peace and ultimately sovereignty. But the war, like all wars, did not go according to plan. And as the battles continued, and tens of thousands died, thousands of prisoners began to be captured, and it became clear that neither the Union nor the Confederacy knew what to do with their captives. This resulted in the Union and Confederates building several provisional prisons that turned out to be exceptionally inadequate to hold, care for, or deal with the massive number of POWs taken over the course of the four-year war. For those imprisoned, these confinements were often deadlier and far more terrifying than the perils of the unforgiving battlefield. One of the most infamous penitentiaries of the American Civil War was Camp Sumter, or Andersonville Prison in Andersonville, Sumter County, Georgia. This Confederate jail was one of the deadliest places during the war, and while only in operation for less than a year and a half, its place in the annals of history marks it as one of the most notorious and horrific locations in the United States during the American Civil War. Welcome to Rat History. And today, we will begin our deep dive into Andersonville Prison with Part 1, Its History. Because neither side of the Civil War had adequately prepared or planned for a long war, no concessions or official policy was created for the exchange or care of prisoners of war. By the end of 1861, both armies had formed a rudimentary parole system, allowing prisoners to go free on the condition they swore an oath to not return to the battlefield and resume combat roles in their respective militaries. Others were given positions in their prisons as parolees, granting them more freedoms and comforts than their brothers at arms who were still confined. Neither the Union nor the Confederacy felt they had to take care of their prisoners, and often turned a blind eye to the suffering of their captives. In 1862, a more formal exchange system for POWs was established, but it lasted for less than a year before falling apart and out of favor with the commands of both the United States and the Confederate States militaries. Union Secretary of War Edwin Stanton wrote to his officers to and the contemporary prisons, such as barns, tent cities, warehouses, and train depots, became permanent to hold the ever-increasing number of POWs. In 1863, as the fighting neared the Confederate capital of Richmond, where many of the Union POWs were held, the rebels required a new location to house their prisoners, whose presence placed tremendous pressure on the city's supply chain and fueled a growing fear of a prisoner and slave revolt. Captain W. Sidney Wilder was selected to find a new place for the Union soldiers and found that Andersonville, Georgia was an excellent place. It was a tiny village deep behind the Confederate lines and allowed for the confinement of prisoners far from the front. The location, about 60 miles southwest from Macron, Georgia, was surrounded by woods, swamps, and farmland. Locals were horrified at this proposal, fearing the arrival of Union soldiers would incite a slave uprising, but their feelings were ultimately ignored and construction began on the new prison at the start of 1864. The prison was erected by about 900 slaves, pressed into service by the Confederacy, and a 15-foot wooden wall was constructed to enclose 16 and a half acres of land. Along the fortification were towers, or pigeon roofs, built approximately every 30 yards apart that overlooked the grounds. As the population of the prison grew, it forced the Confederates to extend the grounds an additional 10 acres in the summer of 1864. Within the walls bubbled a stream called the Branch, which poured down the center of the camp and would act as the prison's water source and bathing location. Crudely built sinks or latrines were constructed at the top of the hill of the camp above the stream to act as the camp's facilities. The parallelogram shaped stockade stood at 1,620 feet long by 779 feet wide. Within the walls of the prison was a 19-foot space that surrounded the entirety of the camp. It was marked by a fence and was dubbed the Deadline, where no prisoner was allowed to cross on penalty of death. The camp was guarded by a small contingent of generally newly recruited Confederates and volunteers, standing between 1,000 to 3,000 strong, who stayed in a small military camp on the outside of the prison. In the case of an attack by the Union, earthen forts were constructed to house artillery. The prison opened to thousands of prisoners on February 25, 1864, and over the next few months brought in about 400 captured Yankees a day. Andersonville quickly became synonymous with wretchedness, pain, and suffering. 
and the scene that welcomed the new arrivals became infamous throughout the United States. Private Aslaxon of the 9th Minnesota Cavalry described the scene within the prison in great detail, writing that the sight of all this misery, the starved, dying, and half-naked humans all around, those with scurvy, misshaped limbs, swollen limbs, swollen joints, and festering sores infected with gangrene, all contributed to make the newcomers so unnerved that he would soon get a mental condition of despair out of which the ghost beacon of death seemed welcome. By the summer of 1864, over 33,000 Union soldiers were confined within the stockade, leaving very little room per man, about 33 square feet each. Supplies were few and far between, with cornmeal and about a pound of uncooked meat served daily from the prison bakery as rations, but resources ran out quickly, and many found themselves scavenging through the camp for any scrap of food. To try and supplement their starvation, those with cash or items to trade would seek out stores run by Confederate guards and other prisoners to purchase goods like flour, eggs, wheat, peaches, sour beer, and tobacco. But very few of the Yankees had the means to get enough. Sick, loner, or weaker captives were often robbed of their supplies by more aggressive and desperate prisoners who would travel in groups and assault or sometimes even kill for gear and food. Starvation was one of the leading causes of death in the camp aside from illness or infection. The open-air prison had no shelters beyond that of prisoners' own construction, usually formed of spare wood and blankets and shirts. Those who were unable to make a tent would often dig holes to lie in, or huts out of the clay from the camp's earth. All were subjected to the infestations of rats, lice, fleas, mosquitoes, and flies, and the harsh weather of Georgia from its brutal sun and torrential rains. When it did rain, the sinks would flood and human waste would intermingle with the fresh water, creating a vile mix of toxic filth and a brook of muck and mud. Illness would spread quickly, aided greatly by the close quarters of the confined, contaminated water and miserable food. Diarrhea, fevers, dysentery, and scurvy ran rampant through the incarcerated, and any bites, cuts, or scratches would be at a high risk of infection, leading to gangrene and necrosis. A tent hospital, located just outside the walls of the prison, was equally overcrowded with the sick and injured but with the raging war and the high number of sick and starving, little medicine was available to go around to care for the soldiers. Little could be done to care for the Union prisoners beyond trying to let them die in peace on a cot in the hospital tents, rather than in the mud and filth inside the prison walls. All the Union dead were buried in rows in the designated cemetery next to the camp. Fighting among the soldiers was common, often over food or equipment, but also over gambling debts. Many of the Yankees would play dice or cards to pass the time, and bet more than what they had in hopes of earning more. Those who lost and were indebted to the victors were often subjected to beatings and harassments by those seeking payment. Some inmates, often using their units and brigades for recruitment, formed gangs to assault other prisoners and force them to give up part of their rations or pay them for either protection or supply of luxury goods. The Raiders, a particularly notorious and violent squad of Federalist prisoners of between 100 to 700, would stalk weaker ones or loners and steal from them usually attacking in smaller units and disappearing into the crowd. The raiders were eventually hunted down and forced to disband after taking on the Regulators, another group of Union prisoners who fought back, leading to the punishment of many of their participants and the execution of the raiders' six leaders, which was overseen by the prison's commanding officer, Captain Henry Wirtz, on July 11, 1864. By autumn, continuing pressures from the advancing Union troops under General William Tecumseh Sherman who had taken Atlanta and was gaining further ground across the South in his infamous march to the sea, forced the guards and officers of Andersonville to ship the more able-bodied prisoners out to other prisons, such as to Florence, South Carolina, and Millen, Georgia. Those ravaged by illness or infection were unable to travel and were kept at Andersonville. By moving some of the detainees out of the prison, camp life improved, although this was short-lived as the prisoners at Millen were soon returned to Andersonville remaining there until they were liberated at the end of the war. When word of the treatment and general state of the Union prisoners at Andersonville reached the North, it was used as propaganda to continue pushing forward and crush the South. It was said cannibalism was rampant, and tens of thousands had died there while being hunted and beaten by Confederate troops and guards for sport. Andersonville became a focal point of contention for the treatment of prisoners, inspiring the Secretary of War for the North, Stanton, to treat Confederate prisoners in the same manner that the Union POWs were being treated in Andersonville. Things did not improve for any of the prisoners of war during the last few months of the Civil War. In the fall of 1864, Louis Manigault of Charleston, South Carolina, 
served as secretary for Major Joseph Jones of the Provisional Army of the Confederates, copied reports for the Major on his visits to the prison camps. In his letters to his wife, Manigault described the state of the prisoners he saw in the camp and hospital alike, describing one of the more devastating days where 130 Yankees died in the hospital, which is the maximum of deaths thus far in 24 hours. They die from disease of the digestive organs, such as diarrhea and dysentery, brought on by the rude prison life, filth and diet, with no variety and many of them succumb to hunger. The Confederate surrender on April 9, 1865 allowed for all prisoners of the war to be released, but many of the prisoners, not just at Andersonville, required extended stays in hospitals before being able to return to their homes. Many former Union prisoners would die from complications caused during their time in Andersonville, ranging from diet issues due to chronic diarrhea and kidney failure from enduring long periods of starvation. Over the course of the Civil War, over 400,000 prisoners were taken overall. Of those POWs, at least 50,000 died inside of their prisons, which is about 12.5%. At Andersonville alone, out of the believed 45,000 Union prisoners who had spent time there between February of 1864 and its liberation in the spring of 1865, 12,920 men have been noted to have died there, which is about 29% of the prison population. A much higher and more horrific number when we consider the scale of the war and the deadliest prisoner of war camp for the Civil War. Captain Wirtz was arrested and stood trial for war crimes, and despite being offered parole in exchange for incriminating Confederate President Jefferson Davis, was executed on November 10, 1865, for what had occurred at Andersonville Prison. One prisoner, John E. Warren of the 7th Wisconsin Artillery, wrote of meeting Wirtz in the summer of 1864 during his time in Andersonville and had asked the commander if something could be done to help the wretched and sick in Camp Sumter, who were dying by the hundreds every day. Wirtz, described with tears in his eyes, replied, I am doing all that I can. I am hampered and pressed for rations. I am even exceeding my authority in issuing supplies. I am blamed by the prisoners for all of this suffering. They do not or will not realize that I am a subordinate governed by orders of my commanding officer. Why, sir, my own men are on short rations. The best I can do is see that your sick comrades are removed to the hospital. God help you, I cannot. Whether this was true or merely an excuse, we may never know, and to what extent he could have done more will never be known, especially since supplies to the South were greatly limited during the last months of the war. But what remains true is that Captain Wirtz remains the only person in the United States to be executed for war crimes, and is a notorious figure of debate and the perception of Civil War history. He is often seen as another casualty of the camp, trapped by the desperation of the Confederacy in the last years of the war, and his sense of loyalty to the Southern identity. Former prisoner, Dorrance Atwater of the 2nd New York Cavalry, was assigned on June 15, 1864 to work in the Andersonville Hospital and recorded the names of the prisoners who died at the prison, making a private copy that he smuggled out of Andersonville upon his release in March of 1865. And, following the end of the war, reached out to Nurse Clara Barton to assist in contacting the families of those that had died in Andersonville. Their work helped establish the Andersonville National Cemetery and later published the death register, helping to identify those that had come through the gates of Andersonville and perished within the walls of the prison. His work, along with the efforts of other former prisoner clerks, had allowed for nearly 95% of the convict graves at Andersonville to be accurately identified and marked. Today, Andersonville Prison stands as part of the National Park Service, along with the memorial, the Andersonville National Cemetery, and the National Prisoner of War Museum, attracting tens to hundreds of thousands of visitors a year. It remains a place of deep fascination and an important facet of American Civil War history. Thank you for watching Rad History. We hope you enjoyed part one of the history of the infamous Andersonville Prison. If so, please be sure to check out part two on A Day in the Life of Prisoners at Camp Sumter, and be sure to subscribe and leave a like. Feel free to leave a comment to suggest other topics of history you would like us to cover. Until next time, this has been Rad History.